Well, hello everybody, it's me, Ollie, and you're watching We Are Ocean Vancouver, episode number three, recorded from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, youth and Musqueam nations. Cease and I enjoyed looking at all of your wonderful ecosystems drawings so much on our app, We Are Ocean Vancouver, that we decided to talk a little more about ecosystems today. So how about we go put our boots on, our gloves on, and our winter coat, because we have to climb up to the top of Mount Seymour to meet Seas. Hot squile, eich tenoyup, toits tenat quien quen shaman, and sis quien sna. You can see I'm in this beautiful forest. It's winter. We also say tum tum, and uh, tum tum is the snow. It is uh, winter time. It could be the name uh, to signify a winter village, or it could be a snowbird. So we use that word, we use that as our signifying element of winter winter things. So here we are in this forest and it's um, it's a second growth forest. It's not an old growth forest. It's definitely no longer an ancient forest, but it is a forest with remnants that are left from an ancient forest, an old growth forest, and therefore there are parts of this forest that might signify uh, that there are plants and elements that are left over from the Ice Age. And on the Pacific Northwest Coast, the forest and the ocean are very connected. For example, uh, today we see the snow and we know that water is transformative, so it can change from what is uh, visible as water to mist to ice and also to snow. And so what we're looking at today in this background and surrounding me is uh, what I would call a bunch of baby trees. And the reason that they're babies is that they are not uh, more than 200 years old, some of these trees. And we will be looking at uh, parts of the forest that are left over from what was logged here 100 to 150 years ago, leaving this forest bare and vulnerable to the environment and to the different elements of the climate. but. Uh, the really amazing thing is that with this forest being so resilient, it is growing back trees, and as I said, they're babies, and I will talk about what makes uh, an older tree and what a baby tree is. So, for example, if I can put my arms around a tree and my fingers touch, that tree will be about 150 years old or less. If, I, if my hands start to become more and more separated, we can tell that it's maybe a bit more than 150. If I put my arms around and I'm only in a quarter of the tree, that tree is more than likely 1,000 to 1,500 years old. Sadly, we're not gonna find uh, full living trees of that size, but we will find stumps that have, a, um, have still remained after 150 years. And that's the part where we start to learn how does this forest grow back when so much has been taken from it? How does it remain resilient? And there are parts that connect the ocean to the forest. And one of the main parts is actually the birds. So bird life is very, very important to the health and well-being of, of a forest that is close to the ocean. And by that, uh, the very simple act of a bird picking up a shell from the ocean and bringing it and dropping it in the forest so it breaks on rocks or on hard logs, especially in the winter, that will crack open the shells and then the bird can come down and eat what's left and then they leave the shell. And those shells that start to you know, get trampled on maybe by other animals or by people start to grind into the earth and what it does is it feeds nutrients to these beautiful trees. So in some of the thickest uh, ancient forests on the Pacific Northwest coast, you will find uh, if you go down with tools like an auger, an auger is a tool that you kind of spin and it goes down into the earth. And when you pull out the core, you can see shells. So I've gotten to do that on some occasions with work I've done, and it's mind-blowing to see that. 
but it's that element of understanding that the shells uh, were brought there either by human intervention or by animals and by le leaving them in the forest they every time it rains and every time material falls from the trees whether it's boughs or branches leaves uh, fruits cones when they start to decompose they press into those shells and when it rains every time it rains again the water starts to filter the nutrients through those shells into the root systems and so we're also going to be looking at parts of this forest that have mycelium and mycelium is one of the most magical parts of the forest it's a part that we don't often see because it's underneath but at times we find mycelium on the surface and it gives us a visual indicator that the forest is being cared for even more. So for example, I'll talk about how rocks are our ancestors and they are like the oldest living beings on the earth. And then I'll talk about how uh, the trees are the second oldest beings on the planet and they're the grandmothers. And so the trees and other plants provide oxygen. And another part of the forest that is really incredible are, as I said, are the fungi. So lichens and mushrooms are all in that fungi group. And they, when they live under the surface around the root systems of trees, and the trees' roots get close to each other and even overlap, it's the mycelium that creates almost what we call and refer to as a Wi-Fi, uh, as an, an unseen network that connects the communication of one tree to another. And it's a very exciting part that, uh, that more people are learning about now is how mushrooms and fungi, lichens, all contribute to the communications. But even more importantly is that they create an air filter so they're like the lungs of the forest. So everybody can take a big breath. If you're outside and you see steam coming out of your body when you breathe out, that's another level of the transformation of water because our human bodies are made up of over 75% water. So when we breathe in and out, it's, it can be steamy. And that is the moisture in our body coming out and also connecting with the environment around us. So um, I'm hoping that the next time that any of you are out in the forest, you can look for some clues that will help you make a connection. If you find a shell in the forest when you're walking, or if you find some fungi or lichens, these are elements that can teach you about how the forest communicates with one another and how uh, moist air carries spores that travel. And they can travel as far down as to the ocean. They could travel on the river stream and go out to the ocean and be carried to other lands. So plants whether we're aware of it or not travel by the water and through that traveling they make connections between the water and inland in a rainforest such as this so shall we go looking for some cedar stumps and hopefully some mycelium that would be absolutely amazing
Hatsquail ech tenoyep, toitstanak quien quenchamen, sis quiensna. How about some story time, everybody? I thought I would share a story about a very famous uh, set of mountains that overlooks Vancouver and is uh, a story that happened in the very long ago. It happened centuries and centuries before any of my family could even remember back. But we have passed this story down over several generations and it is a story of how those mountains came to be. So in the very long ago, there were a lot of unhealthy relationships between indigenous people on the coast. We didn't completely get along. In fact, it was a very dark time in our, our timeline. And at that time, there were wars that went on between nations from nation to nation, for all the way from Alaska down the coast. And the Coast Salish people of the many tribes, at least 54 nations that were living harmoniously for centuries. Prior to that, we had a lot of war going on with northern people like the Kwakwakawak and the Hilchuk and the Niska'a and Taltan, and it goes all the way up through the Haida people and onwards. So this story is about two young women who were sisters. They were twin sisters and they were the daughters of, their, uh, of the great chief of their nation. And this man that was the leader of this nation was not just a regular person. He had, uh, he had special powers, transformative powers. And we call the people, he, the beings that he comes from, the Chais. So the Chais were very transformative and they could change themselves into humans or they could change into different animals. They could also transform different beings, like a mouse could become a human or a human could become a mouse or a cedar tree or a stone. So while the father would go off to travel in his great canoe with his two brothers and his sister, and they would travel around and change things on the landscape while also giving gifts to the people to survive better and to thrive. But for those of the, the people that didn't get along with each other or tried to create negativity between one another, and the Chais witnessed this, they would transform them often into stone. So while their father was off turning people and other creatures into stones and cedar trees and other things, the daughters were always in the village doing very important work. They were seen as the most highest level of matriarchs in their community and not because they were, they, you know, they would be the equivalent of princesses really, but not because of looking down on people. When we think in a modern day about monarchy, we think here are the royalty and here are the people. But in fact, in our long ago, our people saw eye to eye, but there were people that took care of others in a bigger way and it was very humble work. So these two sisters that were twin sisters, they would do all the important work every day, gather berries, they would gather food, they would organize with the fishermen who were coming in to divide out the salmon. So every fire in their longhouse had a chance to eat well and they would gather cedar bark and other materials for weaving and everybody in the village that needed anything could ask these two young women. They were the daughters of their great chief and they knew their work was to oversee everybody's safety and all their needs when their father was away. One day the young women were looking out to the sea and what they noticed was that the big canoes that our warriors would travel up and down the ocean highways in were filled with warriors, uh, but only enough to leave space to carry people and objects and resources back with them. So they knew, these sisters knew that the next thing that would happen is those men would go to war and they would fight with the northern tribes. And the reason being is that we'd had our village raided and as a result lost people, 
mostly women and children, and we lost blankets and baskets, everything that we need to thrive, and especially our food. So these young women decided that they needed to talk to their father as soon as he returned from his journeys and his adventures. And the very day that he came back, which was within about a few days of these big ocean canoes departing, they went to their father and they said, Father, we have a request for you. We have, a, we have something we need to ask you, a big favor. And he said, whatever it is, I grant it to you because you never ask me for anything. And they said, great, because we would like you to stop those canoes from continuing this war that has happened for centuries. And he was like, oh, okay, I will. <laughs> because you have never asked for anything and I gave you my word I will ask for them to come back so he sent smaller canoes with uh, the warriors that practice every day they're in these very small canoes that we call the war canoes because they're very stealth and sleek and they can get into places very quietly so the other thing that these canoes do is travel fast on the water to send messages and off they went they had about a week that they had to work on catching up to these bigger canoes. And so when they uh, would find those canoes, they would have to tell them, you can continue your journey to these villages, but instead of waging war, you must go in peace and ask everybody from every village that we've ever fought with to come to our village, Hamalchitsan, for a great feast, a slahashan, and to do that we will be receiving you all and we will bestow gifts upon you and we will feast for days and days so off those men went and i always think these young women were very smart because they knew that no matter what those canoes would have to travel two to three weeks one way and two to three weeks back so it gave them a month and a half to two months to start working gathering foods gathering medicines weaving everything that they could do to create mountains of gifts for our wonderful guests that were coming from many places. And when those canoes did arrive, there was a great slahashan that lasted several weeks. And at the end of it all, the two young women were married off and they did not leave our, their village. On the other hand, they made those uh, new partners of theirs, their husbands, stay with them in the village. and. When they came to the end of their very long lives, their father, because he was transformative and he was a chais, he would live hundreds of years while his more half-mortal daughters would only live to a certain age. So when it came to the end of their lives, he gathered them up in his hands and he put them on, onto the highest hill he could find. And they became the great mountains that overlook all of Vancouver and we call them Chaichi Oi, Chaichi Oi, Chaichi Oi. It means the twin sisters, and they represent the great peace that came between all the northern communities and ourselves. And to this day, people travel from all of those places and they know the great story. They know the story of the time before the great peace, and they know how we all came together to form this unity and love and peace and harmony that we know today. So I'd share this story to think about how we overcome hardships in our community and how we overcome hard times over many years. And even when things are negative for a very long time, if we all work together, we find a positive end and we find a goal that fits us all. So hoichuk. We chuck yoth, OCM, unhot squalowins, toits do not quien quen shaman, signing off. Have you ever seen salmon in a beautiful British Columbia rivers? Well, I have, but something that I didn't know is that salmon have a huge impact on forestation here in British Columbia. Cease is going to tell us all about it. So 
Han Hatsquail. I'm standing next to this beautiful ancient stump. It's a Chai Chai Pe stump, a cedar stump, western red cedar. You can even see the red in the texture. And I'm really happy because I can see beautiful mosses and lichens all over this ancient cedar. So although this tree was logged maybe about 150 years ago, the stump is still here providing nutrients for the forest. And I'm reminded about how I've heard many stories, not only from indigenous people, but from scientists who make references to how salmon and cedar are related and connected to one another. So one of the most famous scientists on the planet, David Suzuki, did a, a little bit of research on cedars and took a snipping from a 900 year old cedar in Haida Gwaii and brought it back to his lab and to his delight and surprise, he found salmon DNA in the cedar. So we know as indigenous people, we've known for centuries that salmon are essential in giving nutrients to cedars and to other plants in the forest and that they help to feed the, the whole entire tree. So I'm reminded about how a cedar from the indigenous worldview can be fed from the root systems all the way up to the top boughs of an ancient cedar that could be 900 to 1500 years old. And to imagine that a, 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 the simple act of an eagle or other bird flying around with a piece of salmon or a whole salmon in their talons and then dropping it on the ground near some cedar roots and eating and taking parts that it wants and leaving the bones and whatever flesh is left on it to rot into the soil and to feed the nutrients of the soil that then go into the whole tree and they feed it. So we love how the ocean and the forests and the Pacific Northwest coast are all connected to one another and they live a very symbiotic relationship. As you can see, losing salmon is an example of the awful effects of global warming here in British Columbia. Losing salmon will not only be an ecological disaster, but a huge, huge, huge loss for our indigenous communities. Now we are going to go to the wonderful Atchery in North Vancouver, where we're going to learn more about some people making an effort in preserving salmons here in British Columbia. Hot squile. I'm talking to you here by the Capilano River system and I want to draw attention to the declining salmon stocks in the Pacific Northwest coast. So for example, this river system does continue to sustain coho and steelhead and that is a very important thing for my community and for the indigenous communities that, that rely on this river system and this entire watershed for the survival of salmon. And about 15 years ago, uh, in 2005, there was a serious accident just south of Whistler, BC, at the Chiakamis River. And in that river, we lost 500,000 sockeye salmon fry in a matter of moments when a train derailed and poured chemical toxins into the river. So for the last 15 years, my community has not been able to access our own supply of sockeye salmon. And we still have to work on remediating that river system and the forest surrounding it. So when we look at a place like the Capilano River system, which is in a very urban environment, and it, uh, the tributaries feed off into different directions, 
along the, the hillsides of North and West Vancouver. And some of those streams continue to have salmon, which is a really great thing, but they're fighting environmental issues, urban uh, pollution, whether it's from the air, from the, the different, uh, I don't know, the businesses, people having pools that might run off into the stream. There are several dangers at, at the edge of every water system in this entire district here. So on this river system, there is a fish hatchery and the fish hatchery helps to support as naturally as possible the survival of the sockeye, or not of the sockeye, I'm gonna start that over again. So we're in the Capilano River system near the Capilano hatchery, the fish hatchery, and in this fish hatchery, the coho and steelhead are supported through fish ladders all along the river and inside the facility. And this is a way that is supporting the salmon to, to stay alive and to thrive in an urban environment. And that is a positive thing, although it's not, um, it's not as natural as it could be. So we, as indigenous people, we're very concerned that we're coming close to the end of what is the most incredibly important keystone species of our food uh, that we harvest even after thousands of years the things that we've lost in the last hundred years or so we are still able to catch salmon we are still able to pick wild berries but our salmon stocks are declining so we need to look at proactive ways of, of protecting the salmon and protecting the forests that support the habitats that keep these bodies of water healthy, the, including keeping silt out of the, out of the riverbeds and other pollutants that, that basically drown or choke off the life forms such as salmon. And I think in this forest here, we're looking at several species of birds, of uh, anything from moles and shrews through uh, wild animal, wild cats like cougars and lynx, bears, deer. So even in an urban forest, we have to look at these factors that this environment is at risk. Now, what are the things that we can do to prevent further damage in the environment? We can look at writing to local politicians as one way, but the real work begins in the forest by not leaving litter, by reporting any, any dumping that people do. There are people that will go in the forest and dump garbage because they don't want to pay to go to a transfer station. There are people that uh, work out in the forest and they use heavy equipment and they leave cans of oil or other fuel containers in the forest, which then tends to leach into the river system. As humans, we really have to think about what our, what our part is in this equation and how do we prevent ourselves from damaging very fragile ecosystems and how do we prevent ourselves from falling down, following that pathway that the generations before us have done, where they're not worried about a train derailing. They're not worried about uh, when they go and log some trees and they leave empty oil cans. And even people that come to visit a forest like this for the day and leave uh, wrappers from their food, or they maybe they think it's nothing to dump liquids into the river system. Anything that we do that doesn't belong there is going to harm this environment. And that's the really important thing we have to think about today is how do we take care of what we still have left. I believe we only have a third of our Pacific Northwest Coast forests left to us. So planting trees, uh, removing invasive species, cleaning garbage. When I go for walks in the forest, I often bring a little bag with me and I fill it up with the garbage I find in the forest. And if everybody did that, then we would actually save a lot of lives of wild creatures. 
birds don't know that cigarette butts are not healthy, that they're not food. They try to feed that to their babies and kill them. We also have to think about how even a, a chocolate bar wrapper or a sandwich wrapper or a Ziploc bag could contribute to the death of all kinds of animals. So this is the things that we're really hoping you'll think about how to do your part. Just because we don't make a mess in the forest doesn't mean we should not be part of cleaning it up. So never feel bad about carrying a little bag to carry some garbage out with you. Learn about safe removal of invasive species so you don't harm other animals in the environment in the process of taking them out. And talk about how you could adopt a local part of the forest in your community. <laughs>